about uh, Charter's being pushed off common land, but this has been an ongoing process since the Charter of the Forest in the 1200s. Another document that followed Magna Carta gave people the right to roam animals in the forest to gather firewood and in grow crops to a certain extent. And since then, we've had the dissolution of the monasteries, taking one sixth of the land mass that the church owned and distributing that to robber barons. You've had it for over a 200 year period, the acts of enclosure, forcing peasants off the land into the factories to provide cheap labour for the capitalist industrialists of the Industrial Revolution. And later, we, we have seen this with travellers and gypsies in 1968, where they were denied access to common land. And then even further, in 1994, when they were prevented from stopping by roadside labour, etc., in the major government. But the real problem is, is those who think, like Frank, that you know, if you own your own house or renting it from the mortgage company, that you're somehow safe. Well, those who um, get to a certain age and can't maintain their own homes in a, in a place they've bought, paid off the mortgage, it starts to become more and more expensive, more difficult to maintain those properties. The same with those people who bought flats, council flats, in shared blocks who are now finding getting hit with massive <coughs> bills for the maintenance of the whole block. I speak to someone recently and it was, it was tens of thousands and I've seen pros where they're talking 45,000 for blocks in Dagenham, where they above shops to uh, repair for part of the leaseholders' responsibility. So you've got all those issues surrounding it and those who think that somehow owning it gives them this sort of, you know, what they call property owning democracy, it's a bit of a fallacy really, because uh, I was reading the Labour Land Campaign leaflet re uh, recently that said 17 million householders only own 4% of the land in the country, whereas 40,000 families own 49% of the land. And it's, the, it's in the interest of those 40,000 40, families to restrict the availability of land through things like Town and Country Planning Act, through Green Belt legislation, because you restrict it, you push the values up. And we all seem to get sucked in, working people seem to get sucked into this idea, oh, we don't want developments near us, we don't want this land used for housing, etc. But the more you increase the housing supply, down will come the price. And those people who start to think to themselves, oh yeah, well I'll have this house and I'll prevent development around and I push up the house price, I'll be able to leave it to my children without sort of thinking that that's probably going to be sold off for their long term care in their old age. <laughs> and where are their children going to buy these overinflated properties? Because, uh, you know, even, even with the rents, we're talking now in London, a salary of 52 grand to be able to rent property in the in the London boroughs. In fact, in, in eight of them, I think it's nearly 60,000. So the only real answer, I think, is as John Pickard said, which is you've got to nationalise the land and the building companies and start building mass programme housing, at least 300,000 houses a year, to build three million replacement homes. And I mean, there's one campaign, the People's Charter, which talks about uh, three million homes. But what we've also got to do is to recognise that it's not just about housing, it's about other people's way of life and respecting it. Creating sites where travellers uh, and Gypsy Road, etc., can live on in peace and respecting their rights to live a like way of life that they choose, not for the settled community to try and impose their values on others. Cheers. Jim Rogers, I'm ex everything councillor, leader of the council, and ex Labour Party as well. What I can't get my head around, well, I can, but I can't get to a conclusion, is that nothing in this world of this nature happens by pure accident. It's, it's my view that the years that the Tory party spent in opposition, they were plotted and brains machinating away and all the rest of it. 
So I don't believe for one instant that what is appears to be a no-brainer when it comes to boosting the economy, getting people back into work and all the rest of it, but a mass house building program, considering that just after the Second World War, when it, the debt this country was in then as a result of the war, wasn't what it is today. It was 26,000 times what it is today. And that was paid off about three years ago in total. So what we're looking at today with the sums that have been thrown at us, some frightening us with and the argy-bargy between the bankers and all the rest of it, is quite frankly in some respects mere chicken feed. So there has to be another motive. Because if this building houses, getting the building trade back to work, getting the supplies back to work, building the communities, the shops and so forth, getting the money circulating again, getting the banks to play their part, releasing um, uh, grants and uh, loans and so forth. It seems to me that in this day and age, in the 21st or the 22nd century now we're getting towards, that that would be the first thing that any government with a care for the well-being of its population would take on board. There has to be something else. And I believe that something else lies in the thinking that went on in those years when the Tory party was out of it. And what they're looking at is that A, housing is an a absolute right since the dawn of time. A shelter, a cave or whatever is the first prerequisite to your survival. Somewhere you can get out of it and all the rest of it. That's one thing. The other side of the coin, of course, if you can get people to buy properties and stick a massive great mortgage millstone around their necks, they do not become pretty compliant when you tell them to jump, they ask you how I and, and so on. So it's a double-edged sword like that. But nonetheless, even behind that, right, there has to be a reason why that is necessary. And what we're looking at, and I'll remind you of something that was said by, by Osborne and Cameron at the time they were elected. And it was simply this, it was the measures which we will implement will change the lives of people for generations to come. Now that message is because their capitalist masters have told them that very soon the Western economies will be slumping behind the Eastern economies and particularly China and they need to be planning to have a compliant and very, very obedient workforce in this country that will work for the kinds of wages and so forth that is presently being uh, worked for in those nations if Western capitalism is to survive. I do believe, it might sound I'm totally crazy and mad, but I do think that the people in Canary Wharf, the people in the big mansions out in the sticks, the uh, paymasters of the Tory party do think 25, 30 years, 50 years down the road. They always have. History shows that. They've always done that. Troubling with us, of course, is they act, we react. By which time we never get ahead of the game. I think with the situation that's coming on, that there is an opportunity to get ahead of the game. And I do echo some of the comments that were made here. Things are going to get a damn sight nastier. Because this year, some of the, uh, the cuts and such like that was announced in the very first emergency budget getting on two years ago, now start to come into effect. Some of the really nasty welfare benefit cuts, etc., will be hitting the proverbial right, soon. And it will go on for another year. Because the effects of what was recently being announced and so forth, um, the housing uh, allowances which apply to the uh, private sector, where those have been severely cut in some excuse given <coughs> that it, it will force landlords to lower their rents. I mean, come on, right? that never happens. Um, those things will start to come in. I do believe that when we see the likes of the riots that took place uh, recently last year and all the rest of it, 
there is massive potential for that to happen. I mean, and also what we need on the left is to keep punching this message that they're after all of us. They're not just after the Muslims, the Roma, and black people and all the rest of it, anybody who sticks around like a parapet. They are looking to make the whole lot of us into a compliant mob who will do to in order to keep their rotten Western capitalist system ticking over. Now, if those riots and things do happen, if they do happen, it's bloody nasty, I'm quite sure they are. But unless they leave people who are slowly being pushed down and down towards the bread line, towards poverty, towards um, where a situation where the, the ballot paper and democracy ain't worth the price of the ballot paper and democracy and all the rest of it, because that's the way it's headed. I mean, this mob have made themselves a fixed parliament. There's no way you can get shot of them until 2015. Uh, and, and so on those kinds of retraction of, of democracy and all the rest of it are also part of their, their move. And, um, and, I, and I feel that when the opportunity comes, whichever way it comes, if we can make a case for getting shot of Trident and copying the 75 billion quid that uh, we'll be heading down, you know, we'll be released by that, we should do so. If things get nasty on the streets, we do need to say to the people, we work together, we fight together, and we drop together if necessary. Because at the moment, no other way is being allowed. There is no other democratic way that you can express People are being kettled by the police and all those liberties are being suppressed. The coppers on the horses sit in the back street, the guys with the riot shields and the blue overalls and the helmets are poised and so on. What's going on in preparation for the Olympics? You could say it's a bit of a dress rehearsal for events which might come later on. I mean, there's some absolutely weird and wonderful things in the name of security and so forth being put forward on the back of what's happening on the Olympics. Of course, they don't say about the acres of housing that was destroyed to make way uh, for uh, the Olympic Park, nor are they too keen to say what's going to happen to it afterwards. But looking back through the records, and I do digress a little bit here, there ain't no major city that's hosted the Olympics in the past maybe 50 years who would come forward and say, that was wonderful. By God, did that do us some benefit? I've got friends in, uh, in Sydney, in Australia. They're still paying for it, that one. Right, you know. So uh, it sounds like bloom and doom. But quite honestly, right, I really can't see too much light at the end of the tunnel unless we develop something pretty good. And I think what we have to do, we have to challenge every time when they start spouting off about the deficit, when they start rapping on about the bankers and the profits and the not profits, all the rest of it. We need to expose them for the hypocritical, evil toe rags that they are. Because the money is there, we know it's there, the bankers know it's there, and what you've got is a standoff, basically, between Canary Wharf, the City of London, and the likes of Cameron. They know, down there, in Canary Wharf and so forth, that Cameron and Company, nor I was reckon probably Ed Miliband and Co., would be prepared to stand back and watch one of their major financial institutions crash. We're too big to allow them to go bust, they say. That's the standoff, which they've got the politicians by the short and curvis. For our side of it, it's this evil <coughs> which we're seeing, you know, foisted upon us. That's got a lot of us by the short and curvis. But we have to challenge, I think, the capitalist ideologue, which is basically driving this thing. Because the future they're aiming for ain't the future I want for my grandkids, I'll tell you that. Thank you very much. Yeah.